I think it's important whenever you find some confetti in this room that we acknowledge that he is risen. He's risen. He's risen to See, Easter is all year long, folks. We can do this every week. But uh, yes, confetti, I just found it. Stephanie, let's get after it, okay? Uh, so we've... <clears throat> I'll pay for that later, don't worry. So we started last week on this study of heaven and talking about how uh, Jesus taught us to pray this prayer. You can pray this first part with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For us to pray that prayer and to be aligned with the heart of Jesus, it's important that we understand what Jesus means by heaven. He says that our Father is in heaven and that we're praying that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So that's the goal of this series is to help us align our view of heaven with Jesus's view as closely as we can. So when we pray this prayer, um, we're, we're thinking his thoughts along with that. But along the way, we're going to field some questions that have come in from all over our church family about heaven. And you, you folks have a lot of questions about heaven. It's great. Uh, I'm a little overwhelmed at times because the, these keep rolling in and it's out there. There's some things that are just really out there that are fascinating to think about. So uh, what I'm trying to do is, is choose from the most common questions, the ones that I get uh, more than once and try to respond to them as we go through. So let me just uh, mention a couple of these here at the beginning, and then we'll get into um, talking about the kingdom of heaven. So as we respond to some of these questions about heaven, I just wanna remind you and start with this premise again that um, we have not been invited to help God design heaven, okay? He hasn't asked our opinion about what we think it should be like. Um, most of our views of heaven come from things that we sort of think that would be comforting to us, right? Some of our views are, are very biblically based and, and solidly founded in scripture. And some of them are just, well, it would be nice. I, I, I cannot talk about this without thinking about Bruce Knott's definition, 70 degrees and donut trees. That's it's what Bruce is looking forward to, 70 degrees and donut trees. So we don't actually get to define heaven based on our own preferences, but we can trust that God is, is gonna do a good job, is gonna be great, right? With that in mind, uh, question number one that we'll talk about today is will we know people? Will we be able to recognize people in heaven, the people that we, we know here on earth, or I often think, will I be able to recognize Bible characters? You know, will I be able to recognize like Peter and, and, you know, Paul? And I'm pretty sure that Elisha and I are going to be good friends because he was bald like me and didn't, didn't take too kindly to being made fun of about it. Um, you can look that story up later. But um, our best example of what the resurrected body will be is actually Jesus. In fact, he's our only example. It's true that there are other people in scripture who were raised from the dead, but they were raised to like return to this to physical body. They weren't raised to an immortal, uh, eternal body. And Jesus is the only one in scripture who was raised from the dead to an eternal body. Um, and so our best understanding of what this you know, resurrected body will be like is looking at Jesus. And it's fascinating when you read accounts of people who ran into Jesus after the resurrection that sometimes they didn't recognize him. When Mary Magdalene is at the tomb on, on the, you know, first Easter morning, she thinks he's the gardener. And, and Mary should, she was around Jesus a lot. She should have known exactly what to um, look for but she didn't recognize him at first. You get the account of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus who Jesus walked with them apparently for miles and they didn't know it was him until he sat down and broke bread with them. So there's this implication that Jesus' resurrected body was somehow different. There were, it was still him. I mean, when Jesus spoke, when he uh, ate, when he showed the nail marks in his hands, it was still Jesus, but there was something about him that was just different. 
I think it's uh, similar maybe to how we change over time. I ran into a friend from college last week that I haven't seen in, in 25 years since, since college. And um, when I first saw her, I thought, oh, she looks kind of familiar. But I didn't know until I went up and talked to her for sure who it was. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is Amanda. I know exactly who this is. And she probably looked at me and thought, I, I don't know that guy at all. I mean, because... Friends, I did have a couple decades of hair, and it was glorious. Um, and, and so I didn't need the beard to kind of cover things up. It's a whole thing. We change over time, but as soon as I spoke, she knew exactly who I was, because apparently I have a distinctive voice. And some of you have seen me around town in a hat, and I speak to you, and you're, I, I, can, I can tell on your face you don't know who I am. Um, but then the voice registers and you're like, oh, that's Adam. Yeah, okay. So I, I wonder if it's kind of like that where our, our resurrected bodies are just different in the sense that they are made for eternity. So they can't be like this body that's obviously not made for eternity. There's gotta be something different about them, but we're still ourselves. And so if we maintain our identity, what makes us really us, it seems logical that we will recognize people in heaven, even though they may not look exactly like we look today. That seems logical to me and makes sense to me. Okay, the second question is, can people in heaven now see us? This is a really big one. This is one that um, most of us that have uh, had someone that we care about pass on, we think about this a lot. And the idea that mom or dad or grandma or grandpa is, is looking down on us and uh, smiling over us when we, when we do something good or experience something good is very comforting. Is it biblical? That's, that's an important question. When, when we have these ideas or opinions about what heaven will be like, there's what's comforting and there's what's biblical. And so we, we have to ask that question. Is this biblical that people in heaven now can see us? So that question sort of assumes that when we die, we go, we go straight to heaven and we're in, in the presence of God. We're gonna circle back to that question in two weeks uh, because next week we will not be here. Where will we be next week? At the park, what time? No, for you guys, it's 9.30, okay? I know how the second service crowd operates. So 9.30 at the park next week, and you'll be sure to be there by the time we get started. Okay, I say this in love. So um, the question of do we go straight to heaven, we'll, we'll sort of circle back to next week. There... If we do, if that's exactly what happens, you, you die and then you're in the presence of God, then it's, it's reasonable to think that there's gonna be some awareness of what's happening in his kingdom. That, that's reasonable. Um, the question of whether there's this personal, like looking down on people who are still here, um, I, I don't know, honestly, I just don't know. I, I think about the description that we get in Revelation uh, at the end about uh, the new creation being a place with no mourning, no crying, no tears. And I believe that if, if my grandmother was always looking at me, there would be times when she would be really sad about what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> so what does that mean? You know, how do you reconcile that? Um, so honestly, I just, I don't know. I think it's important to ask the question and also to wrestle with, you know, do we, do we go directly there? Paul says some things in First uh, Thessalonians about us being reunited with our physical bodies when Jesus returns. And so there, there are a lot of questions about that that I just, I, I don't have answers for. But I think the mystery surrounding these questions, I think for the most part, it's a really good thing. It's healthy for us to use our imaginations and, and to form thoughts and to challenge uh, each other's thoughts with scripture. Um, and, and it's good. It's good to ask. It's good to wonder. It's good to think about heaven, even though we don't, really know exactly um, what we're getting into there. So today we're going to really focus on heaven as uh, the place where God rules, um, the place where God rules and reigns. Last week we talked about heaven as the place where God lives, and today we're going to talk about heaven as the place where God rules, which is, um, that means that heaven is a kingdom. Heaven is a kingdom. And I think anyone out there, any human being who felt like um, if there is a God, then he's in charge, right? He's the king. Because that's what God means, right? If, if there is a God, he's, he's, a, he's in charge. And if there is a heaven, that would be the place where God is in charge. So the question then is, what does that mean for us here on earth? Is God in charge 
Here, it seems like if he's God, he's, he would be in charge everywhere, right? Is God in charge everywhere? Yeah. Which kind of challenges our perspective on what's going on in the world around us and sometimes what's going on in our own hearts because there are things that I think and do and say that I'm pretty sure is not what God wants for me. So if God is in charge everywhere, is he ruling every individual life all the time? Not, not my life all the time. There are times when I reject God's rule for my life and I do something different from what God wants for me. What that means is there are two kingdoms. God is the king of heaven. And then there is this other kingdom, this other reality that is the kingdom of earth. And sometimes I, I choose to live here versus there. And we're gonna come back to that towards uh, the end. We're gonna start with just understanding Jesus's uh, descriptions of the kingdom of heaven. When the gospel writers began to summarize what Jesus was preaching as he traveled around and preached, they said, Here, here's the summary of Jesus' message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus said, change your minds about who's in charge because you are invited into this reality where God's rule is absolute. You're invited into this. And so change your minds about who's in charge. Repent. And then he began to talk about what the kingdom of heaven is like. And just in the gospel of Matthew, there are seven uh, parables that start with this phrase, the kingdom of heaven is like. And he would say, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower that went out to sow. Um, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant who discovered a pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's buried in a field. And as Jesus tells these parables, we think, Great, if, if anything starts with the kingdom of heaven is like, then what comes after should give me a clear picture of what heaven is gonna be like. And we read these parables and we kind of go, I still don't get it. I still don't see it. I can't visualize what he's talking about because what we want is like these concrete pictures. What like, what is street, streets of gold and is the, is the pearly, is that one big pearl? And I can't, I can't imagine the oyster that that came from. And then that we have all of these like concrete questions about what's gonna be there. And Jesus is not addressing that aspect of the new creation. He's addressing more of this spirit of what heaven is gonna be like. This, this, the nature and character of it more than the nuts and bolts and we get caught up on the other side. And so when Jesus says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a sower, he, he's using an image that people of his day were very familiar with, a farmer going out to sow seed, right? And hey, here where we live, that's a familiar concept too. We would imagine, you know, Mike House out on a tractor, you, you know, going down the rows and planting, you know, corn or whatever. And then Jesus sort of takes that really familiar image to a, a different level. And at the end of that parable, the seed that is sown produces a hundred times what was started. That's, that's a lot, a hundred times more than, than what was sown. I imagine Mike would love the idea of planting one row of corn and getting a hundred rows of corn out of that. I know that's not exactly what Jesus is saying there, but the image that Jesus is saying is, here's something you're familiar with. This is how parables work. Here's something you're familiar with. Let me, let me try to stretch this in your mind so that you can see that there is so much more to the kingdom of God than what we experience here. So as Jesus uh, teaches these parables, he's not giving us these blueprints of heaven as much as he is like this vision or this um, nature, this spirit of this reality as opposed to the kingdom of earth. And so um, we're, we're supposed to read and study those parables with this wonder and imagination rather than this analytical trying to match every word with some kind of metaphor, right? So uh, another image that we get or description that we get in the New Testament is the Apostle Paul says in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven. If you're a follower of Jesus, if, if you've put your trust in Christ for your salvation, you are a citizen of heaven. We know what citizen means, right? Citizen means I have a home. I, I, I have a people. These are my people. This is my home, right? And Paul says, your citizenship, your home, your people is the kingdom of heaven. And it's not a place that's far away. It's, it's not as though we're not participating in it. It's, it's we get to move from citizenship of the earth into this overlapping space where the, the rule of God is absolute and it's, 
That's what we call the church. The church is supposed to be this, this space in this overlap where the rule of God is absolute. Who's in charge of the church? Not me. It's, it's Jesus, right? He's the king of the kingdom. And so when we live in this space, in this uh, where God's rule is absolute, we are citizens of that kingdom. And the New Testament writers, guided by Jesus' teaching, they want us to think of heaven as this reality that's present here and now that we enter into by choice, by repentance, so that we can live under the rule and reign of God while we're here. And it's not just waiting for it to happen when we die. So the question is, why would anyone not choose to live in that kingdom? Why would anyone say no to living in the kingdom of God? It seems obvious, right? Wouldn't that be the best? But the reality is, we choose not to live in the kingdom of God from time to time because we don't like the idea of somebody else being in charge. We really don't. We, I, want to be in, I want to be the king or queen of my own life. I want to be the one who decides what's right for me. I want to be the one who defines the good life for me. I want to be the one who finds my own way of pursuing peace and joy and purpose. But that's, that's living in a, a me-centered reality versus a Jesus-centered reality. And that's why a lot of people don't want to be followers of Jesus. There are a lot of people, especially in our culture here in the Midwest, there are a lot of people who want to be a Christian, but not a Jesus follower. Did you know, like, that people make a distinction in their mind? They go, I'm a Christian, but I don't know if I'm a Jesus follower. Truthfully, biblically, there's no, there's no difference. That's what Christian means. But we create this distinction. A Christian is someone who believes that they're going to heaven when they die. A Jesus follower is someone who has chosen to live under the absolute rule and reign of God. That's not always the same thing, is it? And we think that we can do both. We can, we can have this hope of heaven without giving God full authority over our lives. But Jesus and the New Testament writers would say that's not how citizenship works. That's not how a kingdom works. In a kingdom, the king has the authority, not you. And kingdoms are ruled by a king. And so I want to take you on a quick run through the history of kingship in uh, Israel for the people of Israel in the Old Testament. And we're going to see how Jesus kind of fulfills what was lacking there in that history. So after the people of Israel are set free from slavery in Egypt and they, they go into the promised land and they sort of you know, drive out most of the people there and they establish themselves um, in the promised land and Israel is their home. There's this period uh, called the period of the judges and there's a book in the Bible called Judges and uh, if you, if you want to read something a little more edgy, you know, this is it. This is go to Judges. Don't read this with your children. It is not PG. It is this downward spiral into rebellion and depravity. And by the end, you're reading those last couple chapters, you're like, this is in the Bible? This can't be in the Bible. This is horrible. This, you couldn't make a movie of this accurately because nobody could be old enough to watch it. It's pretty bad. Some of you are like, which book is that? Judges? Let me, yeah, yeah, yeah. look it up. Here's the theme verse uh, for Judges. This, this phrase shows up a couple times. This is from Judges uh, chapter 21, verse 25. So please read the underlined part. In those days, Israel had no king. That's the summary of what it's like when everyone just sort of does their own thing. It's just this downward spiral into rebellion and depravity. It's no good. And so the people eventually realize this and they go to the prophet Samuel and they say, all right, we're no good on our own. We need a king. And here's how uh, God tells Samuel to respond. This is in 1 Samuel 8. But when they said, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. So God looks at the people of Israel and says, no, it's not that you don't have a king. It's that you've rejected your true king. God says, I am, I am the one who's supposed to be in charge to, to rule and reign over you. And you've rebelled. You've rejected my authority. So even though Samuel felt like he was being rejected as a leader of the people, it was God who, who was being rejected. And so God said, let's, you know, sometimes 
You um, get what you ask for, and it's not what you thought it was going to be. So God says, all right, let's give him a king. And the first king is uh, King Saul. Saul looks like a king. He, he's, he's tall and, and strong and good looking, but he doesn't have the character uh, of a king, particularly for the people of God. Then comes David. David uh, doesn't really look like a king, but he's got the heart of a king, which that's more important, right? And David, David's a pretty good king for a while, but he doesn't finish strong. David, David sort of checks out towards the end on his commitment to God. And then Solomon comes along after David, and Solomon has the wealth and wisdom of a king. I mean, he's, he's, he's the richest, smartest, and he doesn't have the purity of a king, of the people of God. And then after that, you just get this list. I mean, you read through the history of the kings, and you're kind of like, are they just choosing the worst possible people to run their country? You're like, what country would do that? <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I don't know what you think I meant, but let's forget about that and move on. <clears throat> it's just like this, you know, lineup of these just terrible, selfish people. And every now and then you get a good king, and the good king is sort of defined as the one who does the least damage, Right? It's the one who, who does the least worst job, and that's a good king, right? And what that history proves is human beings are terrible kings. We just can't, we're just, we just can't get it together. We're not, we're not holy enough. We're not righteous enough. We're not devoted enough. We're not clear enough in our own character and understanding of the way the world should work. We need a better king. So Jesus comes along. When Jesus is born, from the very moment Jesus is born, you get the wise men from the east, right? And they come, and who are they looking for? They say, where is the king of the Jews? From the very moment he's born, there are people going, I, there, I think the king is here. I think the king we've been looking for is finally here. And that title follows Jesus all the way to John chapter 18, when he's on trial before Pilate, before his crucifixion. And here's what we read there. John 18, Pilate went, uh, then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. So this title, King of the Jews, follows Jesus and ultimately he says, I am a king, but I'm not a king like you think. I'm not looking to take your power or your place I'm not looking to be a military leader. I have a kingdom. And it's just a very different, it's a different reality than the one that you're worried about. So all the people that were worried about Jesus taking over were worried about Jesus taking over here. And Jesus says, I'm, I'm not taking over here. I'm, I'm the king here. And you're invited into this place where you right here and now can participate in a kingdom where God's rule and reign is absolute. And so when we, we think about why wouldn't anybody want to be a part of this, it's because um, where God rules is where what he wants to happen is what happens. And uh, most, of our, most of our experience as human beings with God is more like, have you ever taught a uh, preschool class, toddlers, like three-year-olds? Who's in charge? The teacher? Not likely. I mean, the teacher is the one with the most intelligence, wisdom, maturity, but the teacher is not in charge. It's, it's the will of the three-year-old that's really in charge, right? And sometimes it's just kind of like that. We're living in this world where God is the supreme intelligence. He's the supreme power. He's the supreme, you know, in wisdom. And yet... It's our wills that are really running our lives. This, this desire to be our own kings and queens, our own deciders of what's right and wrong and what the good life is and how we're gonna pursue peace and joy and purpose. And whenever we follow our own wills, whenever we put ourselves on the throne, we are lining up with the ruler of this world. So we said there are two kingdoms, we have two options, and there is a ruler of this kingdom, just like there's a ruler of this kingdom, and Jesus uh, calls out this ruler a couple of different times. Here's uh, one in John 12, where Jesus is talking about his uh, upcoming death and resurrection. 
He says, now is the time for judgment on this world. And we get examples of this kind of language in other places in the New Testament, that there is a, a prince of this world. And who, who would we say that is? That's the enemy of God, right? That's Satan. And uh, Satan doesn't need us to acknowledge him as king. Whenever we put ourselves on the throne of our lives, Satan is going, yep, that's exactly what I want to happen because you're not gonna be good at it. <laughs> I, I, Satan just knows that when we try to run our own lives, it's like the book of Judges. We just are gonna enter this downward spiral of rebellion against God and depravity and bad decisions. And some of us know very personally what that's actually like. And that's living under the rule of the prince of this world. And the incredible offer from Jesus is to repent, to lay our crown down and live under the authority of a God who loves us, who made us, who knows exactly what's best for us, who has laid out a plan for us to have peace and joy and purpose, both now and for eternity, if we would just give up control of our own lives so that we get to a place where we're praying along with Jesus, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we know exactly what Jesus means by that. We know that Jesus means that what's best for everyone is for this reality where God's rule and reign is absolute to grow, to cover more and more human souls because it's a rescue from our own misguided leadership of ourselves. And Jesus says that invitation is there. And those of us who live in this kingdom, this is what we call the church, this space where heaven and earth overlap and the church is the place where God's rule and reign should be absolute. We get to show other people that this life as citizens of the kingdom is what we were really made for. So I, I just want to invite you as we close to think about um, your choice on, that you have every day. So some of us think of salvation or following God or being members of the kingdom was a decision that we made at some point when we accepted Christ or got baptized or whatever, and it's one and done. But that's not how scripture really talks about our commitment to Jesus. It's, it's a daily, sometimes a multiple times a day choice to say, I, I, I can choose between two different kingdoms. I can choose to live my way. I can choose to decide for me what is best for me today. What do I, what's gonna make me happy? What do I think is gonna bring me peace? Or I can let what God has already decided for me run my life. Which kingdom am I gonna live in today? And so I just wanna invite you as we, we close with prayer, would you go ahead and stand? Um, to, to think about this as, a, as maybe a personal challenge to begin each day with the Lord's Prayer. And as you pray that first part about God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, recognize that that prayer begins to be fulfilled in your own choice to let God be king of your life. As each individual follower of Jesus chooses to let God be king of their own lives, then that prayer is being fulfilled. God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. So I just want to challenge you to take, maybe, to set aside maybe two weeks to begin your day with that prayer and make this choice to let God be the ultimate authority of your life and see if that habit, that practice sticks, see if it changes your perspective as you go throughout the day and see if it impacts how you interact with people who are not part of God's kingdom. And we begin to see them with this um, with eyes of compassion and love and grace and wanting everyone to get to live in this kingdom of peace and joy and purpose. So let's, let's take this prayer before the Father this morning. God, we're so grateful that you have invited us into your kingdom. We're so grateful that you, you've really done all the work, that Jesus did all the work necessary to let us in. The, his, his death and resurrection throws the doors open for all who, who will repent and say yes. So for those of us who have made that choice, God, we're just, we're just grateful and our prayer is, God, that we can back that up with a, a daily commitment to live under your authority. Would you walk us gently and patiently through that as we learn to do that more consistently? And God, for those who have not made that choice, who have 
not believed that your will and way is best, not trusted that your rule and reign is good, would you open their eyes to what you have to offer them? And maybe do that through us. Maybe let our lifestyle of Jesus-centered living be the example that others need to begin to trust you with their own lives. And as we offer all of this up, God, we just pray that every good thing brings glory to you. In Christ's name, amen.